to open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 25. That's where we left off last time. So 1 Samuel. What's your timer for? Use it for a show be here. Turn. So you want to turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. Find lesson seven in Shobi there. And the title of this lesson is David and Nabal. Okay? David and Nabal. Sometimes we forget about this. You know, it's not David and Uriah the Hittite because of Bathsheba. That one's a little bit more familiar. Uh, but this has some similarities to it, but a little bit different. Okay? Uh, David married Bathsheba, the, the wife of Uriah. Uh, so we maybe think of that, but uh, um, anyways, we'll get going here on uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. I'm going to read the first few verses and we'll discuss some things. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran, and there was a man in Moan, whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and had three thousand sheep and a thousand goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and of beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. So, let's stop there. We learned something. Samuel, that little boy, tiny little child who had been brought by his mother, Hannah, to Eli, because she had no children. She had desired children. For years, she didn't have any. And then God blessed her. She prayed for this little boy. And the Lord answered her prayers and gave her this little boy. And she had promised him to the Lord, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him to you. He will be your servant in your house. And the Lord answered her prayer. So that little Samuel that grew up and taught, was taught by Eli and instructed under his tutelage and became a great priest during the time of the beginning of the kings. He anointed Saul and he has now anointed David to be king. Samuel dies. Okay? So you can imagine a great time of mourning Okay. He was a great and important man in our understanding of Bible history. But, the people bury him. Now David, he has to run again. They probably take off and it says he went to the wilderness of Paran. And then, because that's where David goes, and because David is going to be interacting with this man, the Bible introduces us to Nabal. And I had asked you on your sheet, describe some things. Read this text and tell me some things about Nabal. Well, you can say he was wealthy. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep. So he's some type of shepherd is his work. He cares for animals. That's how he makes a living. We can also say, factually, he has a wife named Abigail, a beautiful woman. But we can also say something else about Nabal. He was churlish and evil in his doings. Okay? We can say that he probably was not a very honest man. Okay? but probably harsh and hard-working. In fact, uh, we probably uh, can say he was probably pretty foolish or an evil man. wasn't honest in his work, and yet he was married to Abigail. She was intelligent and beautiful, as we'll see in this, but she also loved God. She loved the Lord and was a faithful. She was a good wife. And yet... She too falls into a sin that we'll see here in this lesson. So there, we've been introduced to Nabal, and we know Saul has, or Samuel has died. Now, why do we have to be introduced to Nabal? David has some interactions here. Beginning at verse 4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him, that liveth in prosperity, peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard 
that thou hast shears. Now the shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them. All the while they were in Carmel. Ask the young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants, and to thy son David. And when David's men, and when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David, and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto my men, whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those things. And David said unto the men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men, and 200 abode by the stuff. David is fleeing. Once again, he needs food, as we saw before, when he got bread. This time, David is out near this area where Nabal lives. Okay? David says, well, if they're shearing the sheep, let's see if we can't get some meat from them. Let's see if we can talk to these men and get some food. You see, David said, there's a reason why we should be able to. While we were out here in the wilderness, away from Saul, hiding from him, we helped. We had nothing to do, and we saw these shepherds in the field with huge flocks of cattle and us men, many of us being shepherds ourselves or having cared for flocks as young boys, we said, hey, let us lend our hand and help these men. So we helped them. We made sure they didn't lose a single sheep or a single goat while we were helping them. You would think that this very prosperous man, this man Nabal, David, says he's, he's prosperous. He surely should be able to spare a little food for us in return as a gift of thanks for us helping out care for his sheep. Now, sheep shearing is a pretty happy time, a festive time, so it would make sense. You go to a festival, you typically expect there to be some food there. Okay? And typically people at celebrations and events when you get together, it's an opportunity to give. We have that too. Many times we gather together, maybe for meals or dinners, and there's a box put out. Or there's an envelope put out and people say, hey, if you're willing to give, please do so. Or maybe we have a school auction and someone says, well, it's only worth that much, but this is for a special cause. I will open up my checkbook and I will give even more. And that is a good godly way. God has richly blessed us and he gives us those blessings so that we can return them to his church and his kingdom. We do that by giving liberally to the schools and to the churches and many other kingdom causes that God has given us. And so it would make sense that David would think, well, this man Nabal would do the same. It's festival time, sheep shearing, time to be happy. So he'll be more than willing, I'm sure, to give us everything that he has. But that's not the case. So David, while he doesn't know that yet, he sends some young men to go to Nabal. Make sure you tell him. Those men come to uh, Nabal. They uh, express the greetings of peace. They expressed that, hey, we protected you and your men in the, in the desert. You didn't lose a single animal. In return, will you please give us some food? Well, Nabal was foolish, selfish. No, he says, who are you? There's, there's probably hundreds of men out there and groups out there that have broken off from their masters, and now they are all going to come and say the same thing. Do I got to feed the whole countryside? No, no, I'm not going to do that. Hey, Nabal was short-sighted. He was only thinking about himself today. He didn't think of the long term, what the consequences would be. So often we do that in our lives too, in our sin. We lash out with some words that are mean towards somebody because we want to get them back. And we don't think, hmm, I'm going to have to show up and see that person again tomorrow and deal with them. And now because I've made an enemy, that's not going to be very fun. We're so short-sighted often, we don't think of the long-term consequences. And Nabal should have thought of those consequences, but he was a foolish man. 
He also was probably afraid to help David because of Saul. Ahimelech, the high priest, had been killed by Saul for giving the sword of Goliath to David and for giving bread to his men. And so that word had probably spread through the land. So that also was probably in the back of Nabal's mind. I don't want to be on David's side. Saul will come for me. Well, we read here at the end, David was not a happy man. It seems as though we might use our phrasing. We might say this was the last straw, the straw that broke the camel's back. And David, in a fit of anger and rage, tells his men, gird up your swords, put them on your belts, get ready to go. And David and about 400 men took off, marching for the home of Nabal. 200 men stayed back with all of their possessions to protect them. David, he, we can say, has a right to be angry here when it's a good righteous anger. And yet, his anger is causing him to sin because he has murder in his heart. That is sinful. That is wrong. As we saw a few weeks ago, anytime we have angry, anger so often leads to sin, and the anger is also symbolism of our own selfishness and of our hearts and our own sin. Okay? But David may not kill. That is only the Lord that could tell him to do that or do it himself. Okay? All right, continue on, verses 14. So how, what, what's going to happen here? Is David going to kill him or is it averted? But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us both night and day. All the while they were with us there, them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial, meaning Nabal, that a man cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and two hundred cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so as she rode on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. How does God prevent David from committing murder? God uses the servants of Nabal. They are wise. They know that their master is a hard man. They know that their master is, is being foolish here in his response. These men who were out in the fields know exactly how good of a job David and his men did of protecting them and watching over them. And this man knows. No one can try to talk sense into the master. He's a hard man. He's a foolish man. He doesn't care about anybody but himself. His wife, however, is a wonderful woman. She's intelligent. One can go to her and bring to her the questions and problems. And it's through Abigail that things can maybe get done with her husband. So this servant goes to Abigail and repeats to her, Abigail, these men came from David. He treated them in a bad, miserable way. I mean, he was, he was going after them. What's that term that he used there in verse uh, 14? Railed on them. He said he railed on them. It's as though he was yelling and screaming, Get out, you fools! And so he says Master, uh, to Abigail, Master was foolish. And now, Abigail, we hear news. David and his men are marching towards us. And they're not going to just kill the master. They're going to kill all of us. Now what shall we do? Please go talk to the master. Well, Abigail, quickly, using probably some servants, gathers up a ton of food here, wine, all kinds of things. She lays them up onto some of the donkeys, and she goes ahead. Now, she sends the servants ahead with all the food, and it's her goal to plead with David that he not act in this foolish manner. Okay? Now, she did this sneakily. She did it in a manner that her husband didn't know. We read the word covert. She came down by the covert of the hill. Hidden by the hill. He couldn't see her. She didn't want him to know because she knew he would become angry with her. But it was the right thing to do. Verse 24 is where we'll pick up. And what happens... So she comes before David, gets off her donkey, in verse 24, and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, and let 
Thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thy audience, and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. That gives us a clue that his name probably be is fool. Names often were, had a meaning to them in the Bible times. As his name is, so is he. Foolish. That's what this man is. That's probably what Nabal means. And folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and even evil hath not been found in thee all these days. You have to recognize there, the capitalized words, Lord mean God, and the lowercase Lord means David. David is as a Lord to her. So, what happens? Abigail uh, meets him. She shows, bows down, shows him how sorry she was there by getting down on her knees. She was reverent to him. She spoke from her heart. She said, put the blame on me, not on Nabal. He's a fool. Deal with me instead of my husband. I wasn't there when your ten men came in. But now I'm, I, I know all about it and I agree with you. But also, David, don't let the sin of murder come upon you. If you do this, it will be murder. But that will make you no better than Nabal. Don't let Satan be working here. Okay? And here is all the food. And she presents it to him. Okay? What will uh, David's reaction be? Well, of course, David is thankful. And he decides, well, I will not kill um, verse 32, And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me, and blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord of Israel liveth, which has kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hadst hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by, more, as by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted thy person. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry with him, him for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, that his wife had told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone and it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal and he died. So, what's the result? Well, the provisions are given to David. David. David is thankful to Abigail. You've prevented me from committing murder. David and his men probably go back towards their possessions. Abigail is able to go back to the house and sneak in. When she gets there, her husband is having a feast. Okay? And it's there at the feast that he's so drunk, she realizes, I can't tell him anything. He's not going to understand it all. Or, if I tell him anything, he'll be so drunk and he'll fly into a fit of rage and he won't be rational and he'll do something foolish. So what does she do? She waits until the next morning. The next morning, she tells him all that she had done, how she had averted danger, how she had saved his life and the life of herself and her men and his men. And he, obviously, is not happy about it. But the Lord is at work here. And his heart begins to die. It says it becomes a heart of stone. He probably had some type of stroke or like heart attack where he was still alive, but he was probably left incapacitated. And ten days later, Nabal dies. The Lord sends him the stroke. That was his punishment for his behavior before. It's the Lord that does the killing. Now, what's the result of that? Well, verse 39 and when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. So David recognized, I need to leave these things up to the Lord. I should not have gone there to kill. But then, and David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spoke unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself on the face of the earth and said, Behold, 
Let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. But Saul had given Michael his daughter, David's wife, to Phaelti, the son of Laish, which was of Galam. We see here the sin of adultery committed over and over again. Abigail is eligible to marry. Her husband has died. David is not. He is married to Michael. But Saul has taken Michael and given her to someone else. So David is without a wife. But yet, because she is not dead in the eyes of the Lord, David may not marry. For if he does, he commits the sin of adultery. And David does. He marries Abigail here and has now committed the sin of adultery. But not just with Abigail. He takes another wife, Ahinoam. Okay? And he begins to take many other women as well. David is now what we call a polygamist, a man with many wives. Only have one wife, God teaches us. So the Bible instructs us, one wife, and that's it. David has committed the sin of polygamy. He was disobedient, but he did it anyways. So, we do see David here was kept from sin. David was thankful for that. How often haven't you had that? You were thinking of doing something so awful and terrible to somebody or you wanted to get them back and you didn't get the time or opportunity and later on a different opportunity arose and you realized if I had done that I would have not had this opportunity. Boy, am I thankful to the Lord that He kept me from committing this sin. God was guiding me there because if it was up to me I would have done it. But thankfully the Lord worked in me and in my life not to do that sin. And now can live with that person or live in that situation in peace. I don't have to do that. Thanks be to the Lord for keeping me from sin. So we can remember that too, just as uh, David did here.